Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a new series entitled Resting in Christ. Can you guess what that's about? Let's see if we can figure it out. This particular lesson gives us contrast living in a 24-7 society. That doesn't sound like very restful stuff to me. <laughs> This is lesson number one in that series for July 3 of 2021. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word from various aspects. We are thankful for those who prepare these lessons and are challenging us, challenging us to explore these issues. Be with us now as we think together and talk together and worship together that we may Honor your name as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In our modern world, especially in the more developed countries, life tends to be very busy. Technology has made us available, if you understand what I'm talking about, available, 24-7. That means if someone needs to get a hold of you, they can get a hold of you. Times for rest are difficult to find unless there's a specific planning for it. It's easy to feel harassed, unable to accomplish all that we need to accomplish, and losing our touch with God. Think of all the things that you need to do in a given week. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to sit down, even in a day, okay, these are the things I need to do today, <laughs> boom, boom, you, whoa, <laughs> really did I try to do all that today? Is it easy? Is it easy to pack it all in? We are, import, we are impacted by rush hours, work hours, online and offline conversations, sometimes medical appointments, school functions, and even shopping. There is a constantly a need to hurry and bustle and finish what we are doing so we can move on. My wife just told me a few minutes ago that um, we have some friends that live clear across on the other side of the country and we heard that there was bad storms over there. Call them up. Find out what's going on. I mean, that's just the world we live in. What did God have in mind when we created a special rest? He's, he created a special rest day for us. Jim? Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3. And so, the, and so the whole universe was completed. By the seventh day, God finished what he had been done, been doing, and stopped working. He blessed the seventh day and set it apart as a special day because by that day he had completed his creation and stopped working, American Bible Society. It's very important to recognize that when it says he rested, it's talking about he stopped working. It doesn't mean that God, if God all of a sudden decided to completely rest, the whole universe would collapse. Well, what do you think? Did God think Adam and Eve at the Garden of Eden were going to be so busy that they would need a day of rest? Or was that day set aside specifically for a closer communication with and or communion with God and the angels? Or did God realize that trouble was coming and that we would need to set aside a specified time to honor him because of his gifts of life to us and all that that involves? I think probably both. Yep. Some of the first and as it developed, he saw down the road. Mm -hmm. but how, without uh, setting uh, some time apart, how are they going to learn mm -hmm. from him? You know, if, yeah. uh, if we refer to God as, as a father, a duty of the parent is to teach the kids. Well, that takes time. Yeah. And they're not born with all, all information. So there's a, it's a learning. And I th think we maybe don't put enough uh, that, that space or uh, value on the importance of learning. Yeah. Think of all the so-called labor-saving devices that we have now available to us. Communication is so easy. Computers have made, the writing, have made the writing of letters and the transmission of information so much easier, almost instantaneously can be transmitted. But as that happens, we realize that the people expect more out of us. They may even want to have access to us 24-7. You know, it used to be that you asked for a medical record and you were lucky if you got it in two or three weeks, it would come by mail in, a, in an envelope. 
Now you, you call the patients in the, in, in, in the office and you call them, we need to have those records, and bam, yeah. they send them over. Got it, yeah. And they used to say, I can remember as a child in our church, uh, people used to say, well, we got, we've got rockets and this and that, and do you think God would let us get beyond here? Oh no, that'll never happen, and now we just <laughs> had a helicopter on Mars. Yeah. Admittedly, it's only a little one, but they're out there. Why is it that so many people don't think they can get through the day without lots of caffeine? Think of some of the examples in the Bible where rest is important. So let's take some examples. Soon after Jesus called his disciples officially to follow him in the territory of Galilee, remember he went down there, was baptized, he went out to the wilderness, he came back, he went to his first Passover and so forth. Then he spent a year sort of under the radar traveling around in, in Judea because he knew that he, if he started making himself very public in Judea, he would be in trouble. Then when John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus says, okay, the time has come. I need to move on, and he, he, he went to Galilee. And so shortly after that, he started his work in Galilee. He said, okay, it's time to call his disciples. He got the 12, and he named them, and after praying about it for a whole night, he prepared them to go out as apostles. He knew that it wouldn't be very long before they would have to go out and stand on their own. So they were sent out two by two to help each other with the following instructions. Carrie? These 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan towns. Instead, you are to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Go and preach, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases and drive out demons. Okay, now I have to ask you a question. When Jesus said to his disciples, go and bring the dead back to life, they said, okay, no problem. <laughs> I mean, how, if you were given those instructions, how would you respond? You, you want us to do what? You'd wonder about it for <laughs> sure. Well, if you really were given the power by God to bring people back to life, to heal lepers and to drive out demons, would it be any wonder that people from everywhere would be coming and asking you to help them? I mean, Every reason for have you heard what's happening? The guys walking down the street can raise the dead. And we still got leprosy. Yeah, well, try to imagine what kind of rush there would have been on any person who had the power to do all those things. Yeah. I'm not sure why we do not have any records of healings done by the disciples while Jesus was still present. I wish we had some, someday we'll get to see that, I hope. Yeah. We're gonna see what, what are the disciples, how do they start out? I, I, I would like to know, how do they approach people? You know, would you like to be raised from the dead? No, I mean, you know. Well, Christ obviously, he must have been taught quite a bit about it with the angels coming and talking to him. Yeah. And uh, they probably, swap the whole lot between themselves and we even dream of it. Yeah. Well now, they went out, they were doing God's work. Yeah. They were, I mean, there was nothing wrong, at least as far as we know, they were doing a good work out there. In fact, what they were doing was wonderful and hopefully they were spreading the gospel in addition to healing people. But even that kind of work needs to be interrupted by periods of rest. And that's what we're gonna talk about just as Jesus told his disciples. It is possible to be overwhelmed by doing good. And so this was Jesus, after they came back from that effort, going out around through Galilee, they came back and this is what Jesus said to them, Mark 6, 30 to 32. The apostles returned and met with Jesus, and it's interesting, it says, the who returned? The apostles. Why aren't they called disciples? You're right. What does disciple mean? A teacher or something, isn't it? No, no, not a teacher. Quite. A learner. A learner, okay. A learner means a person who's a student. A disciple is a student, basically. What's an apostle? A witness? Someone who's sent out to do, it's, it's the same, apostle in Greek is the same as a missionary in Latin. Okay. Yeah. 
He sent out to do a job. So these people have been sent out to do a job. So already Jesus is calling them apostles. Yeah. Even though this is very early in their ministry. Jesus, I mean, you know, this is, usually we don't call them apostles until after Jesus is dead and they start spreading the gospel all over. No, Jesus is calling them apostles as soon as he sends them out to Galilee. Is that related to apologist? Apo uh, it's a little different. But they're still, it, the the, word. They're still he's like their yeah. nature of, a, of an ambassador. Right. That would be maybe a better, yeah. easier to understand. Mm -hmm. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. What did you expect? Yes, yes. So he said to them, let us go off by ourselves to some place where we will be alone and you can rest for a while. He says, you need to rest. What about Jesus getting some rest? So they started out in a boat by themselves for a lonely place. But there's a problem with that. What's the problem with that? Well, this, you remember? The storm came up and they were worried it was going to... No, well, that came early. later. Yeah. That came later. The problem with going out on a boat in the Sea of Galilee is it's not that big. It's about eight miles across and 12 miles long. The people saw him. Oh, yeah, he's, there he is. He's going right there. I'll, I'll bet he's going to that town right over there. <laughs> they met on the other side. Yeah. Well, setting that story aside for a little bit, think of the ways in which God has encouraged us to get enough rest. Jim, Psalms, want to read a couple of those for us? Psalms 4, verse 8. When I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Now, you think about David's history. Why do you, where do you suppose he was when that was written? It could be when he was under the conflict with uh, He was Saul. being pursued by Saul, yeah. Exodus, verse, uh, chapter 23, verses, uh, verse 12. Work six days a week, do to, but do no work on the seventh day, so that your slaves and the foreigners who work for you and even your animals can rest. Then Deuteronomy 5, 14, but the seventh day is a rest, is a day of rest dedicated to, to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. And then Matthew eleven twenty eight, come to me, all of you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. All from the Good News Bible. Thank you. God intends for us to have, a, to have certain cycles built into our lives, day and night. I mean, that's an obvious one, we have to. Six work days and then a Sabbath. And he didn't leave the results to chance. Observing the Sabbath is a commandment. It's not merely a suggestion. Well, it's more in the nature of a prescription. Yeah. For, it's a prescription for life because you gotta learn have time to learn. God doesn't want to occupy all your time. Uh, he, and he's not in need of praise, he, but you need to have an opportunity to, to learn and listen. So what could you do to improve things in your own life? Do you ever feel physically, emotionally, and mentally worn out? Be there. <laughs> well, some of us may be rushing around so much that we are physically exhausted. Others are strained to the point where they are emotionally empty. Yes. And all you need to do is talk to some of the healthcare professionals. Um, I work with a lot of them and we just keep them just, yes. I mean, they, they, I don't know if they get a moment to sleep or rest or anything. There's so many people who need psychiatric and yeah. psychological help. Um, okay. And if these two types of exhaustion, the physical and the emotional, combine, discouragement, even depression may set in. Yeah. Consider the story of Baruch. Jeremiah's scribe as things were getting worse and worse in the city of Jerusalem. Now let's just review really quickly. What happened, what, what events happened in Jerusalem in the lifetime of Baruch? You want me to read it? Well, I, I want you to tell me first and then I'll Okay. <laughs> then we'll have you. Do you remember? The, the city of Jerusalem was overrun and conquered three times by Nebuchadnezzar. And the last time he was so tired of messing with the Jews, he just completely just turned the city into a pile of rubble. 
So that's the kind of environment we're talking about here. Go ahead and read the verse there. Uh, reading from uh, Jeremiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 5. In the fourth year that Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, was king of Judah, Baruch wrote down what I had dictated to him. He, then I told him that the Lord, the God of Israel, had said, Baruch, you are saying, I give up. The Lord has added sorrow to my troubles. I am worn out from groaning, and I can't find any rest. But I, the Lord, am tearing down what I have built and pulling up what I have planted. I will do this to the entire earth. Are you looking for special treatment for yourself? Don't do it. I am bringing disaster on the whole human race, but you will at least escape with your life wherever you go. I, the Lord, have spoken. Again, that's from the Good wow. News Bible. What would you think of that? Yeah. In order to understand what was going on in Baruch's life, we need to consider several factors. It was about this time that the Lord commanded Jeremiah to commit to writing the messages he desired to bear to those for whose salvation his heart of pity was continually yearning. You remember the story of Jeremiah's writing his, 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 his book? What happened after he carefully had gone to all the trouble and expense of writing it all out? What happened? Torn up or something. And it, they, they, this, the people in the king's group found out about it and they said, bring that thing to me, I want to read it. And he, he would read a column or two and cut it off with his knife and throw it in the fire. And he had to go back and do the whole thing all over again. And those of you who know, uh, the, the book of Jeremiah is, is dated pretty carefully. It's, it's, it's not an order anymore, a chronological order. So I don't know how it got that way. Well, take thee a roll of a book, the Lord bade his servant, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke unto thee from the days of Josiah even unto this day. And may be, it may be, that the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Jeremiah 36, 2 and 3. In obedience to this command, Jeremiah called to him his aid a faithful friend, Baruch the scribe, and dictated all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him. Now this wasn't some kind of electronic device. <laughs> Baruch, Baruch is sitting there on a piece of rough, rough papyrus paper there and he's trying to very carefully, probably wrote half a dozen letters and then he's got to dip, dip his pen in the ink again. And so it was a slow process. Going down now to verse four, these were carefully written out on a roll of parchment and constituted a solemn reproof for sin a warning of the sure result of continual apostasy, and an earnest appeal for the renunciation of all evil. When the writing was completed, Jeremiah, who was still a prisoner, remember they didn't like what he was saying, so they put him in prison, sent Baruch to read the roll to the multitudes who were assembling at the temple on the occasion of a national feast day. Imagine here, everybody's going to church here, and here's somebody reading the book of Jeremiah to them as they go by. And the fifth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, it may be, the prophet said, they will present their supplication before the Lord and will return everyone from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord hath pronounced against his people. Verses 9 and 7. That's from Prophets and Kings from Ellen White, 432 and 433. Remember that Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations. It's a pretty incredible book if you look at it. Lamentations was not written in around, uh, until about 586 BC. So this was later in Jeremiah's experience when Jerusalem was finally destroyed completely by Nebuchadnezzar's army. Jerusalem became a pile of rubble. What do you think Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel about Jerusalem when he returned to Babylon? You ever asked yourself that question? Okay, Daniel, you stay home and work on the keep, keep the place going here. I, I've got some work to do. He goes off and just wipes Jerusalem out flat. And he comes back, well, what did you do? Uh, or, uh, <laughs> 
And what do you think Daniel said back to him? Something to think about? I'm sure it was relevant, whatever he said. I don't recall myself. Well, we're, we don't have it recorded. I just... Yeah. Jim, what does it say in Lamentations? Uh, Lamentations 2, verse 20. Look, O Lord, why are you punishing us like this? Women are eating the bodies of the children they loved. Priests and prophets are being killed in the temple itself. Good news, Bible. Wow. Well, Jeremiah and Ruth must have been terribly disappointed as they saw things deteriorating in Judah and Jerusalem. Consider how God must have felt. Yeah. Think about that. Here it is, a thousand, almost a thousand years from the time he brought the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt, and here they are, you know, down there in Jerusalem, and God, finally the whole thing is falling apart. So how do you understand God's relationship to Israel at that point in time? First of all, notice God's original plan for Israel. Let's be very clear. What was his original plan? Carrie? Reading from chapter 5 of Isaiah 1 through verse 7, Listen while I sing you this song, a song of my friend and his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared off stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them, dug a pit for treading the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me. Is there anything I failed to do for it? Then why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? This is what I'm going to do with my vineyard. I will take away the hedge around it, break down the wall that protects it. I'm going to interrupt there for a second. <clears throat> Does God really do that kind of stuff? It permits things to happen. Okay, does breaking down the wall around it, taking down the hedge, is that, that permitting? Sure. Well, God accused, is it, remember, God is accused of doing that which he does not prevent and that which he allows. Mm -hmm. Even the, uh, the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary on uh, this entry for um, Ezekiel 20, verse 25, spells that out in, yeah. in so many words. Well, he lets the wild animals eat it and trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not prune the vines or holy ground. Instead, I will let briars and thorns cover it. I will even forbid the clouds to let rain fall on it. Whoa! Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The people of Judah are, are, not, are the vines he planted. He expected them to do what was good, but instead they committed murder. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cried out for justice. From my Good News Bible. So, now we need to ask ourselves a question, a really, really important question in understanding the Old Testament. Was God directly responsible for destroying Jerusalem? No. Uh, not really. We know that it was torn down by the Babylonian army. In terms of actually the people who were there and did it, it was a Babylonian army. So why would God claim responsibility for doing it? Probably just the Bible writers. Well, was Satan involved in any way? Sure. And here's the principle I want us to learn, and I hope you will think about it out there. Don't believe it just because I say it, but think about it. See, draw, check, you know, make your own conclusions. In the Old Testament, we see almost a totally monist, that is, God was thought to be the only one outside of human beings that were acting in any given case. So if something happened, and it was beyond explanation in terms of someone who, some human being doing it, then immediately they automatically assumed, oh, it must have been God who did it. That, that kind of monist understanding of events beyond human control, that means there's only one person acting and that person is God. There's almost no mention of Satan or any of his angels' activities. This is in contrast to the dualist, that is, two opposing agencies, God and Satan, acting, which is under, this understanding presented in the New Testament, and especially 
in the book of Revelation. So let's understand that clearly. In the Old Testament, almost exclusively in the Old Testament, if something supernatural happens, who's responsible? They said it was God did it. That was their idea. Many times when it say, says God, it could be not Yahweh, but his Elohim. Because you look, at, you have a, get an interlinear, and you, all of the times it says God is Elohim. And that isn't, and God is, that God's name, the one that's active agent, is, is Yahweh. Yeah, so. Yahweh is the personal name for God, yeah, the, the one. Uh, well, remember uh, the, the Witch of Endor, when yeah. Saul goes there, it says, who do you see? I see Elohims. Uh, so many places in the Old yeah. Testament, it's, uh, Elohim is not referring to the infinite one. Yeah, well, if it, it could be the infinite one, it could be any, any, any place where we would say gods, it would be Elohim. Well, remember it was uh, John, was it 10, 42, 10, 24, um, I say unto you, you are gods. Psalms 82, oh, yeah. 7. I, I say yes, to you, you are gods. He's yeah. talking to the he other heavenly intelligences. Yeah. So uh, th that word geo that we translated as God, G-O-D, doesn't necessarily refer to the infinite one and yeah. his power. That's, that's correct. Thus in the Old Testament, it was automatically assumed that whatever happened was the action of God himself because they felt that if he didn't do it, at least he didn't prevent it. And finally, God gave Baruch, getting back to our Baruch story, a promise that his life would not be destroyed. How do you suppose that made Baruch feel? And what about us? I mean, did he get brazen and say, well, I can walk out in the street, I don't have to worry about these Roman or, or Babylonian forces here. A committed Christian. Again, another thing I want you to think about very carefully. A committed Christian has a guaranteed future. We may, we may have a lot of trouble to go through between now and then, even death, but the future of God's paradise, in God's paradise, is guaranteed. Well, Judah so, was warned. Israel was warned. Yeah. Same, yeah. same thing. During this series of 13 Sabbaths, for this quarter of lessons, we will be talking about rest. What kind of experiences does the Bible mean when it talks about rest? Now, Jim has just mentioned that the book, Elo the, the name Elohim can be used in different ways in the Old Testament. Elohim, of course, is a Hebrew word. There are also many different words for rest. There are several that are specifically talked about in this lesson. The first word is Shabbat, which means to cease work, to rest, to take a holiday. Of course, that's where we get our word, Sabbath. In Genesis 2, 2 and 3 that Jim read for us earlier, there it is. We see that God created for us a Sabbath once a week during which we are to rest and celebrate our relationship to Him. He gave us an example of stopping His work. That's what that means. Another example of this word Shabbat is found in Exodus 5, 5 when Moses, having returned to Egypt, remember after that 40 years out there in the Midianite desert, after having returned to Egypt, demanded that the children of Israel stop working on the Sabbath. So that, that particular Sabbath word, a Shabbat, means what? Stop what you're doing. Okay, rest. Stop what you're doing. Okay, number two, Noach. This word can be translated as rest or settle down. It is even used to describe the spirit of Elijah resting on Elisha. And there's verses, Exodus 20, 11, Deuteronomy 5, 14, Job 3, 13, Numbers 10, 36, and 2 Kings 2, 15, just as some examples. Another word. The third word, Hebrew word for rest is shakat, to be at rest or grant relief or be quiet. It was used to describe the land after Joshua finishes military campaigns to conquer the land. You remember about... Remember that Moses uh, climbed to the top of Mount Nebo and died, and God took him to heaven. But the, the children of Israel were left in the hands of Jericho, uh, in the hands of Jericho, the hands of Joshua. They crossed the river and, uh, you know, marched around Jericho, and it was collapsed. 
And then they made arrangements. They had that problem with AI. But then they got their act together. And uh, following God's instructions, they conquered much of the land. Not all of it, but much of it. They had a northern campaign and they have a southern campaign. So now, when that's all over, what do they have? They have a rest. Okay? So that's a, a rest after a camp, military campaign, for example. Raga. This is our fourth word. word. This word is used to describe the loss of peace. The children of Israel would experience an exile, and again, describing the renewed peace that they would get when they return home to Jerusalem. So they lose this peace when they become prisoners or slaves over in Babylon, and they regain the peace when they come back to Jerusalem. Okay? So how would you describe that? You can think of a good word in English. Never really thought about it. Uh, it's, it's just freedom from war, freedom from oppression, probably something like that. That's a rest. Peace. In Deuteronomy 31, 16 and 2 Samuel 7, 12, this word is used to describe lying down or sleeping in death. These are just a few of the words describing various aspects of rest in Hebrew. And if you sat down, you could probably think of 10 or 15 different words in English that mean various aspects of rest. So we shouldn't be surprised to find that there are a number of these words in Hebrew. Um, rest is very important to us physically, socially, and emotionally. The Sabbath, rest is especially important to us spiritually. And of course, that means that doesn't mean we aren't doing anything. What do we do on Sabbath? We go to church, we fellowship together, we enjoy the Lord's presence, we commune with Him, we may go out and evangelize, we may carry the gospel to other people. And you come home, that was a long day. That's not, that's not resting from, it's resting from our, week that we, our work that we do all week long, but it's not physically resting. For those who believe that death is asleep, it is encouraging to know that those we have lost to death are at rest. Yes. And what does the New Testament say about rest? Now let's go to the New Testament. The most common word used in the New Testament for rest is anapao, which means to rest, relax, even refresh. It is the word used by Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. Come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Paul even used this word to describe the cheering up and rejoicing when good friends came to visit him. Remember, he spent most of the last six or eight years of his life in prison. And when someone came to visit him, that was a refreshing, a, a resting. Um, I mean, if you, I don't know. I've never been in prison, but I'm sure that if I were in prison, I would be very happy if someone came to visit me. A, a little bit like meeting old friends after yeah. years away, kind of yeah. thing, too. A second New Testament word for rest is hesekatso. hesekatso. This word is used to describe the hiding behind locked doors the disciples experienced while Jesus was resting in the grave. Okay? So does that sound like rest to you? No. But this word can be also be used to describe a quiet life for those who at time of trial just kept quiet just keep quiet because they have no objections. So I suppose if you're if you're worried that you might be the next one to be arrested and, and, and crucified, if you're behind locked doors and you think nobody knows where you are, that would be a kind of rest, right? Yeah. Well this verb hisachazo hisachazo is used to describe a very interesting experience that is important to every Gentile. Okay? Uh, yep. Acts chapter 11, reading 1 through 4, 12 and 18. The apostles and the other believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. When Peter went to Jerusalem, those who were in favor of circumcision Gentiles criticized him, saying, You were a guest in the home of uncircumcised Gentiles, and you even ate with them. 
So Peter gave them a complete account of what had happened from the very beginning. Okay, let's interrupt for just a second and talk about that. You remember what happened? Peter is down on the coast. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, which means tanners, tanners deal with dead animals all the time, skid them and prepare their stuff like this. So it's a, it's a contaminated place. <coughs> it's not like this is a pure sanctuary in Jerusalem where everybody's in, purified. And you know, this, is a, this is a place where death is being dealt with every day. Peter's staying there, and then these, these people came. Um, Cornelius gets a vision up there in Caesarea Maritime. He gets a vision. He says, send these guys down. He sends these guys down. He told them exactly where to go. Called for Peter. Peter said, well, come in and have something to eat. Rest. Okay, we'll go tomorrow. And what did Peter do before he left Joppa? That sure he took somebody with him. <laughs> he took six other people with him. And why did he take all those people with him? Because it was the law back in Israel. If things legal, <laughs> you better have somebody to back you up. You better, you better have your backups if you're doing something that's not... Uh, <coughs> excuse me, people think it's not right. Yeah. Well, the Spirit told me to go with them without hesitation. These six fellow believers from Joppa accompanied me to Caesarea. And we all went into the house of Cornelius. So it wasn't me, guys. There was six other guys. All of us were there. <coughs> and when I began to speak... The Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord, the Lord had said. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I stole your text there, Carrie. You're right. John baptized, go ahead. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to try to stop God? <laughs> can, you, can you imagine that? Here's all these people with all their, all their accusations and they're saying, oh, no, no, you shouldn't have done that. And he's, well, <clears throat> did they, you really want to tell me to stop God? <laughs> when they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. This is from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> that story, very interestingly in the book of Acts, is followed immediately in Acts 11. This is part of first part of Acts 11 with this story. Acts 11, 19 to 26. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution, what persecution are we talking about? Rome, what happened after the stoning of Stephen? Stephen okay. The very next day, the, a terrible persecution woke, broke out. And who was one of the people primarily responsible for that? Paul. Paul. Well, terrible person. His name was Saul, wasn't it? Yeah, it was Saul at that point in time. Uh, when, the, when the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch telling the message to Jews only. That's a pretty broad area, big area there. Yeah, it is. But So they were scattering around, but they were spreading the gospel just to other Jews. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, where is Cyrene located? Uh, Libya. Libya. Okay. Where is Antioch located, where they're, where they're going to? Syria. There. Syria. So here's, here's missionaries coming from Libya, Christian missionaries coming from Libya and going to Syria. How does that sound? We hear about that place today. <laughs> yeah. They went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. We don't even know the names of these brave souls. The ones who first, on their own, decided that they were going to evangelize Gentiles. We don't even know their names. The news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, and so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Boy, what's going on up there? We got to we got to put our we got to put some some kind of clamp on this. When he arrived, he saw how God had blessed the people, and he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. 
Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Who does that remind you of? Saul, Paul. To look for Saul or Paul. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. So Barnabas was sent up there to sort of put a clamp on all this crazy baptizing Gentiles. And what did he do? He joined with Paul and did it even more. Yeah. <clears throat> Back to Peter now. Peter was being severely criticized for entering into the house of a Gentile and eating with them. But when six other witnesses confirmed that the Holy Spirit had descended on the Gentiles, just as it had descended on them at Pentecost, they finally stopped their accusations. Then when some unnamed believers began spreading the gospel to Gentiles in Antioch, once again the leaders in Jerusalem became alarmed and sent Barnabas to see what was going on. When Paul and Barnabas returned after their first missionary journey, the news reached Jerusalem that they had evangelized a large number of Gentiles without requiring them to be circumcised and to follow all the Jewish ritual requirements. That led to that famous first general conference at Jerusalem discussed in Acts 15. Some Jewish Christians were very concerned about what would happen if a lot of Gentiles became Christians. What were they concerned about? Well, being tainted, I guess you could say. <laughs> okay. They were afraid that Christians would become, Christianity would become a Gentile church instead of a Jewish church. Yeah. What, a, what a dreadful thought. Should the evangelization of Gentiles have caused the Jewish Christians to lose the rest that they were experiencing? Or should we all be rejoicing when even one of God's children turns back to him? Do you remember the verses in Luke 15, verses 7 and 10? In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Okay, you Jews, you Jewish Christians now, you're saints. You, need, you don't need to repent, right? God's going to rejoice over this one over here who repents and becomes a Christian more than over all of you. There's considerable talk about rest in Hebrews chapter 4. He uses the Greek word katapao, to cause to cease, or to bring to rest, or rest. As you might have guessed, pao, the root word here, gave rise to our English word pause. So maybe that would, you can see the relationship there a little bit. If we say pause, what, do you, what does that mean? Cease Stop. doing whatever. Stop, relax. Arrange. I, um, I did a summer job in Germany after I finished college. And I was running a machine, and this machine would go and it would stop. And if you, it, it wait for you to do the next thing you were going to do. And if you were really good or really efficient, you could keep the machine going full time. And so I, I couldn't talk to the people. I couldn't speak German. I was there working in this factory. So I took it upon myself to see if I could figure out how to do everything and keep this machine going at full speed. And the other workers in the factory came by, pausa, 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 don't work so hard. <laughs> You're going to make us look bad. <laughs> yes. oh dear. And what happens to people who can't seem to find rest anywhere? Well, there's a very sad story told about Cain in Genesis 4, 1 through 12. You know, I'm sure hopefully all there out there know the story of Cain. After becoming upset that his sacrifice was not accepted as Abel's was, he asked his brother to go out into the field with him, and there Cain killed his brother Abel. God then addressed Cain, telling him that he could no longer till the soil and he would be a homeless wanderer on the earth. We do not know exactly all that was involved and why God, quote, respected Abel's offering while he did not respect Cain's offering. But we do have these words from Ellen White. 
Jim? Cain, be- Cain came before God with murmuring and infidelity in his heart in regard to the promised sacrifice and the necessity of this sacrificial offerings. His gift expressed no penitence for sin. He felt as many now feel that it would be an acknowledgement of weakness to follow the exact plan marked out by God of trusting his salvation wholly to the atonement of the promised Savior. He chose the course of self-dependence. He would come in his own merits. Patriarchs and Prophets from Ellen White, page 72. In the story, we discover that if you can't find rest in God, you're not going to find true rest anywhere. Imagine being one of the first few humans to exist on this earth. Don't you suppose that the entire heavenly council was constantly focused on what was happening down here? So what was Cain's response when he found out God's judgment? Carrie? Reading from chapter 4 of Genesis, verses 13 through 17. And Cain said to the Lord, This punishment is too hard for me to bear. You are driving me off the land and away from your presence. I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. But the Lord answered, No, if anybody kills you, seven lives will be taken in revenge. Does that sound like something that God would do? You wonder, and uh, thinking back a little earlier than this, uh, I don't think Cain was as clean as we might think. If you're going to kill your brother with yeah. him like that, he had problems anyway. Yeah. Uh, but the Lord answered, No, if anyone kills you, seven lives will be taken in revenge. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who met him not to kill him. I wonder what kind of a mark that was. I don't know. Uh, maybe a burn or something? Who knows? Uh... And Cain went away from the Lord's presence and lived in a land called Wandering, which is east of Eden. Cain and his wife had a son named, and named him rather, Enoch. Then Cain built a city and named it after his son. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay, so apparently Cain couldn't get crops to go for him, grow for him anymore. God said no, so he goes and builds a city. So he's probably having a bunch of other people grow his crops for him. I don't know. How does that sound to you? Yeah. Is that the Enoch? Or is that the one? This is not the Enoch that we know. That's what I wanted no, to no. Be. Yeah. So after being forbidden to work as a farmer, Cain decided to build a city and name it after his first son. One of the questions that has perplexed some down through the ages is, where did Cain's wife come from? Cain, Abel, Seth, and probably all, in fact, all of their brothers and sisters had to choose to marry a sibling. There were not there were no other human beings to be around to choose from. Which raises the next question. What would be the next question? How many children did Eve have? Yeah. And... Uh, Must have been a lot of them. <laughs> they were degenerated, and she well, lived to be say, but they must probably have. several hundred years, so... Yeah. They must have set in somewhere there. Adam was 930 years, so yep. Eve, I don't know, we don't have any record how long Eve lived, but... Uh... Well, you can be sure that the city that Cain built and uh, named after his son Enoch was not dedicated to God. Yeah. What do we learn about the rest and it- activity in the New Testament? Carrie? I know. Give this, Jim. In the estimation of the rabbis, it was some religion to be always in a bustle of activity. They depended upon some outward performance to show their superior piety. Thus, they separated their souls from God and built themselves up in self-sufficiency. The same dangers still exist today. As activity increases and men become successful in doing any work for God, there is a danger of trusting in human plans and methods. There is a tendency to pray less and to have less faith. Like the disciples, we are in danger of losing sight of our dependence on, on God 
and seeking to make a savior of our activity. We need to look constantly to Jesus, realizing that it is his power which does the work. While we are to labor earnestly for the salvation of the lost, we must also take time for meditation, for prayer, and for the study of the word of God. Only the work accomplished with much prayer and sanctified by the merit of Christ will in the end prove to have been sufficient, efficient for good. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 362. Could our churches become welcoming places for exhausted, tired, depressed people, offering them rest? Is it possible that we're actually too busy? Well, here's an interesting little note here, Carrie. In 1899, a speed record had been broken. Someone had actually gone 39.24 miles per hour <laughs> In a ca wait a minute. In a car. Oh, in a car. I'm looking for carriage. And live to tell about it. Tuesday today, of course, cars go much faster than that, and the speed of the processors in our cell phones are much faster than the fastest large computers of a generation ago. And air travel is faster than it used to be, and is getting even faster. The point is that almost everything we do today is done faster than it was in the past, and yet what? We still feel hurried and without enough rest. What should tell us about basic human nature and why God would have made rest so important that it is one of his commandments? And that's from the Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study for July 2. What do you suppose Adam and Eve did on their Sabbaths? in the Garden of Eden? They didn't need physical rest, I'm sure. I'm sure they spent very happy times with God and with angels. Yeah. How, how serious is the rest problem in our world today? We've already suggested that living a harrowed, harassed, too busy life can lead to discouragement and even depression. There is a growing, and I want you all to think about this very carefully, there's a growing concern, and by the way, if you're interested in getting some of this information that we use here, these handouts are available on our website at uh, theox.org. There's a growing concern among mental health professionals with the increasing number of depressed people they are treating. It is estimated that there are more than 300 million depressed people in our world, and that depression will surpass heart, attack, heart disease as the leading cause of death in a few decades. Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Wow. And I can, I can vouch for this one. More than 270 million prescriptions of antidepressants are sold in the United States alone every year, only in the United States. Yeah. Why do you suppose God chose a palace in time as his premier example of rest? Human beings like to produce massive buildings such as the Palace at Versailles in France, which contains 700 rooms and 67,000 square meters of floor space to represent their accomplishment. But God produced a what? Palace in time. Is it clear to you why Abraham Joshua Heschel calls the Sabbath a palace in time? What do you expect to experience during God's palace in time? What kind of rest do you look forward to each week when the Sabbath comes? Think about it in your experience, and each one of us would have different ideas, I'm sure, but clearly that's a time to spend some, some special time with family. It's a time to commune with God. It's a time to go to church and share with others in the church setting. So many things, these are things to do. They're not like resting in bed. There are things to do, but they are a rest from our usual activities, right? Yeah. Do you get a break in dealing with mental problems, physical challenges, even distressing inter interpersonal relationships? Have any of you had experiences of working with someone that you just, they just rub, on, rub you the wrong way every, every time you come in contact with them? The Sabbath should be a stress buster. Have you experienced the blessings God pours out on his Sabbath each week? So what happens 
if we become so busy that we can't keep up with our responsibility, all our responsibilities, we begin to lose focus. It's easy for us to get so wrapped up in our so-called responsibilities that we fail to take time with God. Two, as we have seen, we become physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. It is easy to do things that we later regret. We can even experience burnout, and some become so distraught that they may commit suicide. Three, it is so easy to begin to neglect prayer and Bible study and our most important relationships in, in life suffer. All we, all who are under the training of God need the quiet hour of communion with their own hearts, with nature and with God. In them is to be revealed a life that is not in harmony with the world, its customs or its practices, and they need to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart. When every other voice is hushed and in the quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. My favorite time to listen to the Bible, listen to the writings of Ellen White, is when I'm running at five o'clock in the morning out through the hills. He bids us be still and know that I am God, Psalm 4610. This is the effectual preparation for all labor for God. Amidst the hurrying throng and the strain of life's intense activities, he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. He will receive a new endowment of both physical and mental strength. His life will breathe out a fragrance and will reveal a divine power that will reach man's hearts. Helen White, Ministry of Healing, 58, paragraph 3. Have you ever felt like uh, your life was full of one mores, one more letter, one more committee, one more text message, one more responsibility? The rest that God offers us does not mean that we won't have problems, but it does mean that we have an internal assurance that He has a plan for our lives that we can never that can never fail. He will never leave us or forsake us. And <clears throat> we're running out of time here. When we become too busy, there's a lot of things that happen to us that aren't healthy. Uh, we need to rest. Our Creator is designed for us to rest. Living apart from our Creator, as symbolized by Cain's experience, only frustrates our attempts to have inner peace and lasting joy. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, stop and think of the idea. We, we need to stop and think of the idea of you're offering us rest. What a marvelous thing. When we lie down in the bed at night, after a busy day, it's so nice to relax and rest. And on the Sabbath, such a special occasion to relax from our regular responsibilities. We just want to thank you so much for providing these opportunities for us to regain our, our strength and our energy so that we can move on with the next responsibilities that we have. Thank you again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.